Hello friends, welcome to Shankar IAS Daily Newspaper Analysis. Today's date is 9-5-2024. Behind me are the list of articles that we are about to discuss today. So without much delay, let's get started. Look at this 2019 prelims question. Consider the following statement. A digital signature is an electronic record that identifies the certifying authority issuing it. Used to serve as a proof of identity of an individual to access the information or a server on the internet. An electronic method of signing an electronic document and ensuring that the original content is unchanged. Which of the following statement are correct? 1 only, 2 and 3, 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. See, it is about two different concepts that is digital certificates and digital signature. So first, let us understand them and come back to this question. Firstly, what are digital certificate? A digital certificate is a digital file issued by a trusted authority verifying the identity of a certificate holder and to associate the public key with that entity. The certificate includes several important pieces of information. Firstly, identity of certifying authority issuing it. This establishes a trustworthiness of the certificate as it is issued by a recognized and a trusted certifying authority. Secondly, name or identity of the subscriber. This is the entity to whom the certificate is issued. Thirdly, subscriber's public key. See, this key is used in a cryptographic operation including digital signing and encrypting data. Fourthly, digital signature of the certifying authority. The certifying authority digitally signs the certificate with its private key to verify its authenticity. Know that the role of digital certificate is akin to that of passport or other ID in digital form. It certifies the ownership of public key by the named subject of the certificate. And this public key can be trusted because it has been signed by a trusted certifying authority. This is how digital certificates are used to establish secure, trustworthy communications between parties in the various online interactions. On the other hand, a digital signature is a technique used to validate authenticity and integrity of the message, software or a digital document. It is equivalent of a handwritten signature or a stamped seal, but it offers far more inherent security. A digital signature is meant to solve the problem of tampering and impersonation in digital communication. Know that digital signature can provide the following. Firstly, authentication. Verifying the identity of the sender and ensuring that the sender is who he claims to be. Secondly, integrity. Ensuring that the content has not been altered since it was signed. Thirdly, non-repudiation. Preventing the sender from denying the authenticity of the signature on the document or a message. Finally, privacy. Through encryption, it ensures that the message is not readable by anyone other than the intended receiver. So, in essence, digital certificates are about securing and verifying identity, while digital signature are about securing data and transaction. Both are crucial for maintaining the trust and security in digital environment. Understanding the specific roles and how they complement each other is a key to effectively utilizing them in safeguarding online activities. So now, coming back to the question, the first statement says an electronic record that identifies the certifying authority issuing it. See, this statement is incorrect because digital certificates or the electronic records that identifies the certifying authority issuing it. Second statement is also incorrect because the second statement says it is used as a proof of identity of individuals to access information or server on internet. But this is the purpose of digital certificate, not digital signature. The third statement says an electronic method of signing an electronic document and ensuring that the original content is unchanged. This is the exact purpose of digital signature. So the third statement is correct. So the correct answer is option C, 3 only. Let's now see the next question. Look at this 2019 prelim question. Consider the following statement. According to Indian Patent Act, a biological process to create seed can be patented in India. In India, there is no intellectual property appellate board. Plant varieties are not eligible to be patented in India. Which of the statement given above are correct? 1 and 3 only, 2 and 3 only, 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. Now, let us analyze each of the statements individually. See, the statement 1 is not correct. Article 3J of Indian Patent Act states that plants, animals, except microorganism, including seed varieties and species, as well as essential biological process for producing 
or propagating plants and animals are not eligible for patents. Statement 2 is not correct. See, the Intellectual Property Appellate Board has been constituted by the Government of India in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry in September 2003 to hear appeals against the decision of the Registrar under the Trademarks Act 1999 and Geographical Indications of Goods Act 1999. Statement 3 is correct. See, the plant variety protection provides legal protection of a plant variety to a breeder in a form of Plant Breeders' Right In India, Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Right Act 2001 is a unique system that aims to provide for the establishment of an effective system for the protection of plant varieties and the rights of plant breeders and farmers. However, there are no laws in India that allow patenting plants. Hence, Statement 3 is correct. So, the correct answer for this question is Option C, 3 only. With this, let's move on to our daily newspaper analysis. Look at this Indian Express article. India and Nepal have a territorial dispute of over 372 square kilometer area in Uttarakhand, involving the regions of Limpiadura, Lipule and Kalapani. Actually, they are historically contested since the Treaty of Sugauli in 1816 and these areas have been shown as a part of Nepal in the recent Nepali maps, including on the newly proposed currency note. Despite previous diplomatic discussion and commitments to resolve through the evidence-based dialogue, no substantial progress has been made. This ongoing dispute has led to periodic friction in bilateral relation, with both nations holding different views on the rightful ownership of the territory. With this background, let us learn about India-Nepal relation using our main answer writing approach. Let me read out the question. India-Nepal relations have been characterized by both cooperation and challenges in recent years. Critically analyze this statement, highlighting key factors influencing the dynamics between two neighboring countries and suggesting measures to enhance their relationship. Here, critically analyze means a candidate is supposed to provide a fair judgment of the statement and break an issue into constituent parts and explain how these relate to one another and present as one summary. So, we can split the question into two parts. In the first part, we will address the critically analysis of the statement. In the second part, we can give the suggestions to improve India-Nepal relation. So, let's start answering. First, start with a brief introduction. It should convey that India-Nepal is having both good and challenging sides of relationship. So, our introduction shall go like this. India and Nepal share a unique bond that is often described by the saying, neighbors by destiny and partners by choice. This relationship is rooted in the deep, cultural, historical and geographical ties. Despite that, their relationship also faces its share of challenges and complexity. As they navigate modern issue and regional dynamics, the enduring partnership between India and Nepal continues to evolve. Now moving on to the body part, we know that India and Nepal are having both cooperation and challenges with each other. So let's write, there is an area of cooperation and how does it create challenges? Firstly, river sharing and border management. Both India and Nepal have shared rivers and an open border to facilitate extensive bilateral trade and movement. Yet, the issues like flood management and unauthorized cross-border activities create tension. Secondly, strong cultural and religious affinities promote goodwill and mutual respect. But cultural homogeneity can lead to assumptions that neglect the unique aspect of Nepali identity. Thirdly, both India and Nepal have shared democratic values that provide common ground for cooperation. However, domestic politics in Nepal can spill over, with some parties playing the anti-India card and perceived Indian heavy-handedness impacting sentiments. Fourthly, India is Nepal's largest trade partner and a crucial source of investment and tourism. But Nepal's reliance on India for the transit and trade due to its landlocked geography creates perceived vulnerability. Fifthly, both India and Nepal are doing joint initiative to address concerns like terrorism and human trafficking. But the border disputes and the India's external security arrangements sometimes strain trust. Sixthly, Chinese influence in Nepal. India and Nepal strive to maintain balance and avoid conflict. However, increasing Chinese investment in Nepal provide Kathmandu with alternative to its traditional reliance on New Delhi, complicating the, st the strategic landscape. With this critical analysis, let us move to the next part of the answer. Now, let's give few points to enhance India-Nepal relationship. Firstly, establishing more frequent and regular communication at all levels, including at the highest political level, can ensure that a small issue or resolve before escalating. Secondly, a concerned effort should be made to address and resolve the contentious border issues through a transparent, evidence-based negotiation and possibly third-party negotiation or mediation if necessary. Thirdly, further deepening economic ties through initiatives like joint ventures in hydropower, 
infrastructure project and easing trade barriers can benefit both economies fourthly enhancing people to people contact through tourism educational exchanges and cultural festivals can strengthen mutual understanding and goodwill fifthly india should maintain transparency in its strategic intention and reassure nepal of its commitment to nepali sovereignty and independence sixthly india needs to be sensitive to nepali nationalism and country's desire for equal treatment in bilateral relation finally focusing on developmental partnerships in areas critical to nepal's growth such as education healthcare and technology now coming to the conclusion part give a straightforward positive and a futuristic conclusion so it can go like this the relationship between india and nepal is a testament to the complexity and the enduring nature of neighborly ties moving forward it is essential for both the nation to continue to engage in open dialogue and cooperation leveraging their long standing partnership to overcome obstacle and enhance mutual prosperity by doing so india and nepal can ensure that their bond remains a source of strength and stability in the region that's all for this answer with this let's move to the next newspaper analysis Look at this news article. Recently, Tamil Nadu state government has increased stamp duty for certain transaction. In this background, let us quickly go through the provisions of Indian Stamp Bill 2023. Before that, let's have a basic understanding about a stamp duty. A stamp duty is essentially a government tax which is levied to register documents like an agreement or transaction paper between two or more parties with the registrar. Usually, the amount specified is fixed based on the document's nature or is charged at a certain percentage of the agreement value stated in the document. Know that the stamp duties can be levied on the bills of exchanges, cheques, promissory notes, bill of lending, letters of credit, policies of insurance, transfer of shares, debentures, proxies and receipts. It is accepted as a valid evidence in a court of law. Stamp duties are levied by the center but appropriated by the concerned state within their territories under the article 268 of the constitution. Now let us see the provision of the bill one by one. See the bill seeks to replace Indian Stamp Act 1899 that has become redundant or inoperative now. The new legislation is expected to reflect the present realities and the objectives. In order to equip India for a seamless digital era The bill includes provision for digital e-stamping. It defines electronic stamp or e-stamp as electronically generated impression denoting the payment of stamp duty by electronic means. There are also provisions for digital signatures. Digital or electronic signature refers to authentication of any electronic record by a subscriber through an electronic method or procedure. The draft bill also proposes to raise penalties. It seeks to increase a maximum penalty amount from 5000 rupees to 25000. for contravening any provisions of the law and impose rupees 1000 per day for repeated offenses these are all some of the provisions of the bill that's all about this article with this let's move to our next news analysis look at this news article us and australia argue that india's sugarcane subsidies breach the wto limits distorting the global trade a recent paper cites data from 2018 to 2022 showing india's subsidies exceeded 90% of the production value breaching the 10% limit India rejected this allegation by claiming errors in the methodology. The dispute highlights challenges in regulating agricultural subsidies within the WTO framework. This is the crux of this news article. In our discussion, we are going to see about WTO's Agreement on Agriculture and Doha Amendment from prelims perspective. Firstly, with respect to Agreement on Agriculture. See, the Agreement on Agriculture is a WTO treaty. focusing on reducing the agricultural support and subsidies given to the domestic producer by the country the aim of the agreement is to establish a fairer trading system that will increase market access and improve the livelihood of farmers around the world know that it was negotiated during the uruguay round of the general agreement on the tariffs and trade also known as gatt and formally ratified 1994 at marrakech morocco subsequently it came into force in 1995 note that It is one of the most contentious agreement within the WTO. Moving forward, it is important to know that the agreement covers products that are normally considered part of agriculture but excludes forestry and fishery products and also the rubber, sisal, jute, coir and abeka. Now let us see the three pillars of agreement on the agriculture. Firstly, with respect to the market access. See it requires the tariff fixed like custom duty by the individual countries to be cut progressively. to allow free trade moreover it also required countries to remove the non tariff barriers and convert them into tariff duties secondly with respect to the export subsidy see the subsidy on inputs of agriculture which makes the export cheaper 
or other incentives for exports like remission of the import duty or included under export subsidy thirdly with respect to domestic support the agreement on agriculture calls for the reduction in the domestic subsidy that distorts free trade and the fair price under this provision the aggregate measurement of support that is ams it is to be reduced by 20 percentage over the period of 6 years by the developed countries and 13 percentage over a period of 10 years by the developing countries under this the subsidies are categorized into three types green box amber box and blue box i am displaying the differences between them please go through it as we have seen already this agreement on agriculture was contentious and was a bone of contention between the developed and the developing nation especially india to solve them a round of negotiation was organized in doha qatar which is doha round of negotiation see the doha round is the latest round of trade negotiation among the wto members it is aimed to achieve major reform in the international trading system through the introduction of lower trade barriers and revised trade rules know that it is also known as semi officially as doha development agenda the round was officially launched at the wto's fourth ministerial conference in doha qatar in november 2001 the declaration held the negotiations on various subjects like agriculture non agricultural market access services trade facilitation etc see the doha round is formally not completed but some issues related to doha development agenda was taken up in the nairobi ministerial conference in 2015 is doha negotiation a success or a failure is a question highly relevant now see the doha round of negotiation has been stalled as the participating nations could not reach a consensus over trade negotiation with major differences existed between developed and developing countries as a matter of debate the following points can be taken as a reason for not completing the doha round the developed countries especially european union usa canada and japan had differences with the developing countries like india brazil china and south africa with respect to the arguments over special safeguard mechanism that is ssm even though the negotiation considered in the doha round was taken up in the geneva in 2008 but were again stalled due to the lack of consensus the developing countries like india supports special safeguard mechanism to protect its farmers from the import surge it also supports the development agenda of doha round for the developing nations and wants each country to support the same moreover india also wants rich countries to drastically reduce its trade distorting farm subsidies moreover it presses for a permanent solution to the issues of public food stock holding in developing countries for the purpose of food security that's all about this discussion with this let's move to our next news analysis look at this news article african union has strongly criticized the israeli's military action in the southern gaza's rafa and it has urged the international community to intervene to halt the escalation of the conflict African Union Commission Chief Moussa Faki Mohamed specifically condemned the extension of the war to the Rafah crossing. In this context, let us revise some basics about African Union. Let us start with some basics. The African Union is a continental body consisting of 55 member states. Here continental body means all the members belonging to the continent of Africa. The image here highlights the member states of African Union. The suspended members include Guyana, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Gabon and Sudan. The headquarters of African Union is at Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. See, the African Union was officially launched in 2002, succeeding the Organization of African Unity. See, the Organization of African Unity originally focused on decolonization and ending apartheid. In July 2002, the African Union was launched from Durban, South Africa. Upon the launch, the African Union shifted its focus towards cooperation and integration among the African states. Through the cooperation and integration the African Union aims to achieve economic development among its member states. Now let us see some points about its organizational structure. See the African Union has a key decision making organs including the assembly of heads of states and governments, the executive council, the permanent representative committee, specialized technical committee, peace and security council and the African Union Commission. It also encourages participation of African citizen and civil society. through the pan african parliament and the economic social and cultural council furthermore the african union is working to establish continental financial institutions like african central bank african investment bank and african monetary fund regional economic communities and the african peer review mechanism are also important components of african union structure now let us see about the objectives of african union first one is promoting pan africanism The African Union encourages a sense of African identity and solidarity among its member states and citizens. Second one is is to promote peace and stability through its Peace and Security Council. Then to enhance unity and cooperation 
the African Union aims to economically and politically integrate the African nation. The African Union also aims to address the socio-economic challenges of African nations through a sustainable development. Then, the African Union also promotes democratic governance and the protection of human rights. It aims to ensure democratic governance through a transparent election and protecting human rights through the rule of law. Finally, the African Union represents African countries in international forum. By representing the African nation, the African Union tries to promote African interest on the global stage. These are some of the objectives of African Union. That's all about this discussion. That's all about today's newspaper analysis. With this, let's move on to our prelims practice question. Consider the following statement. Stamp duties are levied and collected by the state government and appropriated by the union government. It is levied on all legal property transactions and it is an admissible evidence across all courts. Which of the statements given above are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, none. And the correct answer is option B, two only. See the statement one is wrong. Stamp duties are levied by the center but are collected and appropriated by the concerned state according to the provisions of Article 268 of Indian Constitution. Statement 2 is correct. It is levied on the Bill of Exchange, Checks, Promissory Notes, Bill of Lending, Letter of Credits, Policies of Insurance, Transfer of Shares, Debentures, Proxies and Recipe. And it is an admissible evidence across all courts. So the correct answer for this question is 2 only. Look at our next question. Consider the following statements about African Union. It is an intergovernmental organization of 55 member states located on the continent of Africa. African Union Grouping is the successor of the Organization of African Unity, which was formed in 1963. Establishment of African Continental Free Trade Area is one of the notable achievements of African Union. See, African Continental Free Trade Area is the world's largest new free trade area since the establishment of WTO in 1994 and it comprises of 54 countries. Which of the statements given above are correct? 1 only, 2 and 3 only, 3 only, 1, 2, 3 and 4. The correct answer is D, 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. See, all the statements are correct. African Union was launched in 2002. The grouping is the successor of Organization of African Unity, which was formed in 1963. It is an intergovernmental organization of 55 member states located in the continent of Africa. The establishment of African Continental Free Trade Area which came into force in 2021 is the achievement of this organization. With 54 member countries as signatory, African Continental Free Trade Area is the world's largest new free trade area since the establishment of WTO. So, all the statements are correct. That's all for today's discussion. Behind me is the today's mains practice question. Interested candidates can write it in the comment section below. If you like this video, please hit like, share and subscribe. Thank you.